takes the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder All right. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody feeling this morning? Christmas is on the way. We're getting into the holiday swing, and we're here to celebrate the reason for the season, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. That was a little weak. Come on in and find your seat. we got some really important announcements, so if you can listen up, that'd be great, because we give these announcements, and then we have events, and then people say, well, I didn't know anything about it, and it's because... You were talking during the announcement, so here we go. We have the Christmas play tonight, the best Christmas pageant ever, postponed from last week. is happening tonight at 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. Come early to get a spot as close to the front as you can. Uh, students and kids that are in the play be here at 5 o'clock. Four. Paula just said 5 o'clock, so I've got updated information just Now's the time to listen, okay? Five o'clock, kids, be here at five o'clock. Other things that are happening on your seat, you should have a flyer about a movie night that's happening on December 21st. That's gonna be an awesome event. It's also Piper's birthday, so it's a very, very special day. We have that going on. Parents, if you need to do some last minute shopping or you wanna have a last minute date night, drop your kids off. They'll be well uh, supervised and cared for and you guys can go out and have a good time. We've got those things happening. Now, we, ha we are having a Christmas Eve service here on Christmas Eve at 7 p.m. All right, so be here 7 p.m. The first 100 families that come, we've got a special gift, a special ornament for you. So come out, get here early for that 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We're gonna celebrate Jesus' birth, amen? All right, y'all ready to worship? Listen, we're not here to think, we're not, we're, we're here for one reason. We're here to worship the Lord. We're here to make a joyful noise, amen? We're here to lift up holy hands, to raise the roof, to lift up a shout of praise. Hello, are you with me? About five people are with me. All right, we need everybody else. Let's get up on our feet. As Madeline opens us up in prayer, let's get ready to worship the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, and thank you that we're all gathered together this morning to praise you, Lord. I just uh, pray that all our hearts um, are focused on you this morning. I pray that um, this worship is pleasing to your ears, Lord. And we love you so much.
joy this morning? Everybody smile. You're in here. It's nice and warm. We have the joy of the Lord. I know it's rainy and nasty outside, but it is a good time of year. Good season. We're going to sing Your Love Never Fails again this morning. Lift your hands and sing it out with me. Thank you, Lord.
thankful this morning for your love. God, it's a love that never fails. Lord, it chases us down. God, I thank you so much for, for sending your son, Lord, the reason for this season. And God, we worship you this morning. Lord, we put aside everything else to come into this place to focus our hearts and our minds on you. Because God, it's all about you. And we love you so much. Yeah. 
Lord, we're just so thankful, Lord, that you came in a manger. And so many times when we picture that little baby in the manger, we don't think of how much power and might laid there that night. God, thank you for sending your one and only son. Lord, to make a way for us, God, that was such love, such a reckless love that you poured out. Lord, I just thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather here today, Lord. And I pray that as the ushers come and as we take our tithes and our offerings, Lord, I pray, God, that you would just bless that. Lord, we know that we're, we're more blessed to give than to receive. And so I pray, Lord, that we would just give it with a happy, willing heart this morning. We love you so much. In your name we pray. I want to read to you um, out of Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from all of their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angels of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and they called his name Jesus. And this morning, we're going to sing about the reckless love of God, and what, what other act is so reckless that God sent his one and only son to die on a cross for us. He left the 99 to go save the one, and at one point that was me. And I'm so thankful for his love. I'm so thankful for that. And I know it's easy to lose focus this Christmas season, but focus on that gift. Focus on his power and his might and his amazing love for us. Before I spoke a word, you were singing all.
shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me that we've built up around our hearts, no matter the lies that we've chosen to believe that the enemy's spoken over us. I thank you, God, that your love is powerful enough to shine light into those dark places. And I just pray, Lord, that your conviction, God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's so strong in this room, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to sweep through the hearts of your people, draw your people to yourself, God, for your amazing, reckless love. Lord, it doesn't matter how far we've run. It's never too far for you. I thank you for that, Lord. I pray, God, that as Dwayne comes to share the word this morning, Lord, that you would anoint him. God, I pray, Lord, that the very word that he speaks would be your word to us this morning. Pierce our hearts, God, and change our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. We have a very, very, very special guest, our own Dwayne Phillips. He's the deacon chairman here at Antioch Baptist Church. He is an amazing personal friend. He is an amazing man of God. He's going to Uganda, Africa with Mr. Malcolm. Wave at us, Malcolm. All right, that's a little... You wave like half the people raise their hands, just the low profile, right? That's all right. We love you anyway. Carry the, carry the TV. Anyway. Dwayne is going to Uganda in January with Malcolm. He still needs to raise some funds. At the end of this message, hopefully we'll all be up front on our knees repenting before God. Amen. 
But before you leave, you're going to have an opportunity to give, to sponsor this trip, and to sponsor this man of God. I want you to open up your hearts to the word and open up your wallets to give. Amen? Would you give an Antioch welcome for Brother Dwayne Phillips? Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I'm right in front of you. Is it coming through? Yeah. Well, hold on, Dave. Come back. <laughs> yeah. First things first. God has blessed us immensely. If you um, have been around for a, just a few years, you'll recognize how much this church has grown. God's blessing the ministry here. Um, he's blessing our fellowship. One of the important pieces of that are the people that make it happen, that sacrifice day in and day out, night in and night out sometimes. Um, and we would like to honor um, Dave and his family by giving them a holiday Christmas bonus from the church. Thank you, brother. Oh, thank you. We thank appreciate you. So you. Much. Let me pray over you and your family real yeah. quick. Lord, thank you so much for the Vote family. Thank you so much for the passion you've put in Dave to share the gospel, Lord. Thank you so much for sending them here to us, Lord. I pray that you bless their family, Lord, beyond measure, Lord. And I pray that you help them feel the love and gratitude this church body has for them through this small token, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for putting us in a position as a church body to be able to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas yeah, man. to you. Not, hey, not oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Miss Lemoyne. Come on up, Miss Lemoyne. <laughs> Miss Lemoyne does not like to be in the spotlight. She is the busy person behind the scenes. And we're so grateful for everything that you do, that you have done, and you will do. Can I pray over you as well? Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the precious person that Lemoyne is to all of us, Lord. Thank you so much for all that she does and sacrifices without even wanting a bit of recognition for it, Lord. I pray that you take this token of our appreciation and that you bless her with it, Lord, and meet her needs and let her feel the love and gratitude that we have for her. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Ms. Lamar. Isn't it great to be part of a church where you can do these things? This is the fun part. Well, I have, I have a lot of information to share with you today. Um, hopefully there's three things that you will come away from this time we have together understanding. Uh, the three main points I want you to understand is hope, love, and obedience. There is hope in Jesus. And Jesus has an unwavering, perfect love for us. So much so that he died for us so that we can have a place in heaven yeah. with him. Right. And our part's to be obedient. He tells us in his word what we should do. We hear it, and so often we're not obedient. We have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and study the Word and seek the Holy Spirit's guidance to be, in order to be obedient. So I'm going to take you through a story today. I'm going to have it out of order a little bit compared to most messages you would see. I'm going to tell you what we're going to be doing first, where we're going to be doing it, and I'm going to finish up by telling you why we're doing it. And I, I dug this thing out of the drawer. Let's see if it works. No? Not working? Wait, I turned it off. Sorry. <laughs> hey, it works. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Dave, you should use this every week. <laughs> this is a handy little gadget. This is my family. Yeah. Most of you know us, but yeah. my beautiful wife, Brenda, Abby, Luke, Jesse, and Levi in descending order there. God has, has blessed us indeed. And um, I show you a picture of them, even the ones that, that know them, just because, as a reminder of some of the things that will work on you when you say to Malcolm Warfield, sure, I'll go to Uganda with you and I, I, for 13 days. First international missions trip. Sure, I'll go with you. So I've always been somewhat of the adventurous types. Most of you that know me know I'm somewhat gregarious. Um, and I was always looking for new adventures, so much so that I left my small little community in Alabama and traveled all over the country until we um, were blessed with the opportunity to settle back down here. But I always looked for adventure, and I always was the, the sibling that made things to sound big. I don't care if it was just a cooking contest or a hunting contest. I always made it out to be a big deal. It was exciting. 
But things are different. The adventure is different when God calls you out of your comfort zone. It's always fun on your own terms, but once somebody puts something a little uncomfortable in the mix, um, it, it doesn't become as much fun. And God's calling may seem unsafe. It may seem insane by the world's definition, but he wants to refine us, even if it means putting us through the furnace. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this scripture and explain a little bit of what I mean by that to you. It's on the screen. You can look in your Bibles if you want. Uh, Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. Many of you probably know it well. 139 is a powerful chapter. I encourage you to read the whole thing if you have not or don't recall it. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So I say even through the furnace because that word, try me, is a term that's used by metallurgists that refine precious metals, whether it be gold, silver, whatever the case may be. You've probably seen pictures of it. They put it through the furnace, it's, they melt it down, and then all this fuzzy, fluffy stuff comes on the top. They call that dross. And they'll take a little broom or a blower and they'll sweep it off. And they let that metal cool. And typically they go through this process multiple times because they try the metal every time they put it through this process. They put it through the furnace, which is intense heat. A uh, very violent process breaks it completely down and allows the impurities to rise to the surface. And they try the metal. When they try the metal, they look at it after they sweep the dross off. And if they can see the reflection in it, they know it's pure. If they cannot clearly see their reflection in it, they know it has to go back through the furnace. And that's what God does with us. It's what God is doing in my life, has been doing in my life. Um, I pray this is actually a prayer. I encourage you to pray it, but when you pray it, be ready, because you will go through the furnace. Um, some of us more than others, to get those impurities to the surface so God can remove them. Well, let me open this up in prayer. Lord, I, I claim your victory, Jesus. I claim your victory over the sin in my life. Yes. I claim your victory over this world. Yes. I praise you, Lord, for your deliverance and for your grace and your mercy. I pray, Lord, that you just fill me with your power right now, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that not one word I utter would not be in line with your word. It would not be directly from you, Lord. Lord, I most pray for the people here, Lord. I pray that you open their hearts, Lord. If somebody's going through the furnace, Lord, if they know they should go through the furnace and they're resisting it, Lord, whatever the case may be, Lord, I pray you touch their heart right now, Lord. I pray that you just melt us just like yes. smelting that precious metal, Lord, that we would break down and our impurities, impurities would come to the surface today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I've also had a life of avoidance, not just um, adventure. I made up a lot of excuses over the past years not to go on a missions trip. I can't go because I have a family. You saw it. I have four children. They depend on me. My wife depends on me. I can't go off on a, a trip and leave them alone for a week, two weeks at a time. In this case, 13 days. Or Yeah, 13 days, right, Malcolm? Busy at work. I have an extremely busy job most um, most of the time, and I can't take time away from that. They have to have me there. I don't have enough paid leave time, you know, to take two weeks and go to Uganda on top of everything else that may come up with sickness and other things that I want to use it for. So I always said, maybe someday. I think I've said that probably to Malcolm and Dave before. Maybe someday. But I was confronted with my unfaithfulness. Right back in the four-year there, I don't know, a few months ago, I always ask Malcolm about his adventures. Go, Where are you going next? Because I knew it was coming. Malcolm always goes with the seed ministry on uh, multiple trips through the wintertime. And he said, well, I'm going to Uganda. Why don't you come with me? And he probably didn't know it because I'm a master of covering my emotions a lot of times. Right, Brenda? <laughs> but I was so convicted. And the, the more that, that usually I can just kind of sweep that away or sweep it under the rug. The more that day went on and the next day, the more convicted I felt. Um, so I had no choice but to either, either deny God's prompting in my life or be obedient. And if that wasn't enough, as I started sharing it with some of those that know me the most, um, not Brenda or my family, but they've been extremely supportive, but others said that I'm crazy. I said, you're going to raise funds through the holiday season. You don't have enough paid leave 
You have a wife and children you're responsible for back home. You're going to be risking your health. They have all kinds of diseases over there, and it's unsanitary. They said, that's got to be a sign from God right there that you shouldn't go. And, you know, inside I was saying, get behind me, Satan. Because uh, I was convicted. I knew, I knew that he was calling me to go. And I am crazy for Jesus. That's what I've realized. Right. I really am crazy. I've denied it all those years, and finally I, I've realized it's probably true. Um, <laughs> Jesus loves me. If you don't hear anything else, hear this up front. Jesus loves me. He loves you. He died on the cross to purchase a place for all of us in heaven. Yeah. Because heaven's a perfect place, and every last one of us are imperfect. That's right. So we can't get in. That's if right. any of us got in on our own means or our own measure because we were a good person or because we helped others, we would still be imperfect. We would, couldn't get in because heaven would no longer be perfect. So what did God do? He knew it in advance. He, he came, and he in form sent his only son, Jesus, who was perfect, never sinned. The only human to ever set foot on this earth that never sinned. And he gave himself freely to purchase that place in exchange as a sacrifice so that your sins can be covered. I want to be obedient and I want to go and share this news around the world. Um, the other thing I didn't put on the slide is everyone always says, well, there's needs here at home. Go on a mission trip here where it's safe. Uh, but you know what? That's not the furnace. That's just on the edge of the furnace where it's warm. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's, right. that's, a, that's a command for us. And I'm being obedient to that. I'm going with the seed ministry. Uh, seed ministry stands for sowing edibles and evangelical deeds. It was started by Malcolm Warfield in 2003. It was started as a different kind of ministry, a ministry that not only impacts people spiritually, but also impacts them physically and partners with them and disciples them. It does more than just tell them about Christ. It, it does, the ministry does disciple people over time, and it helps them become self-sustainable spiritually yeah. and for physical needs. Uh, obviously, this is the, the where and the what we're going to be doing part of this uh, message. I'm sorry, Malcolm, if I ruin it, but I, I pronounce it Namutamba Aronda Village in, in Uganda. The, these are, well, none of you know any different, so I mean, <laughs> if you can pronounce it better, argue with me. <laughs> but this is, these are some of the pictures of where we're going to be going and the people we're going to be with. You can see pictures of the village here. This is where they live and the traditional huts with the thatch roofs. These are some of the children. And I must say, I had the privilege with um, Malcolm to look at a lot more pictures of what, than what I'm going to show you today. Um, you can see the progression of these children as they've been impacted through the ministry. They did not look as nourished and happy in the original pictures. But over the time, this is the third year that, that the seed ministry has been back to this particular village. Over the subsequent two years before, you can see the difference it's making in their life physically. Here is just a picture of some of the advanced technology the seed ministry brings. Very simple um, methods that work where they're at. doesn't have to be an elaborate uh, farming procedure with elaborate techniques. What's elementary, what works in that area is what is taught so it can be sustainable for them. They plant the seeds first in these little cups to sustain their resources because they have very little rainfall a lot of the time. It takes less water to start seeds in these little fertilize cups and then transplant them to the field and it helps them develop their root system so that they can survive in the the harsh dry seasons and water is a scarce resource outside of the rainy season in the area we're going to you can see the children here you can even see some of the difference in them here uh, not just the uniforms they have on now for their school but also just the the glow in their face <laughs> and as malcolm always says you give a kid a soccer ball they know what to do with it instinctually um, just giving them some of the simplest things brings some joy into their life. And I'm going to tell you something. If you can reach the children, you can reach parents. Amen. That's right. They all receive the supplies they're needing to um, get, the, get the farming started in their uh, village and for their families. 
One of the things that I really like about the seed ministry is the fact that it does not create dependence. Um, Malcolm, you can feel free to correct me if I say anything wrong. But it starts off by supporting them the first year, 100%, getting them started, getting them started with a plow, a means to till their, their soil, seeds, the knowledge, and it stair steps down from there on out. Uh, 75, 50, 25, and in the fifth year, you're fully sustaining yourself. And Malcolm typically, typically comes back just to check in and help with, with any guidance that stays in touch with these villages over the years. 17 villages, by the way. That's just, that's wonderful. 17 communities around the world since 2003 have been impacted spiritually and physically through the seed ministry. And that really brings it home. You see southern state seeds growing in, in these foreign countries. That really uh, demonstrates the go and um, grow. <laughs> aspect here you can on the right you can see a pastor alex miracle um they're just demonstrating some of the packets that have been put together for them getting ready to to proceed and plant and this this young lady is the school teacher right malcolm they did not have a school before and let me just pause for a minute to explain to you where these people are, are coming from uh, a lot of the communities around the world in underdeveloped countries a lot of those people groups were traditionally hunter-gatherers. They hunted, they gathered, they roamed, they fed their, themselves and their families. But in this modern age, the area to hunt and gather is not so plentiful. And when you do have room to roam, most of the animals and resources have been taken or eaten up by the population or populations coming in, moving into their country. So they're really left in a a very difficult position. They don't have the traditional knowledge of growing things and, and farming for themselves. And quite frankly, um, a lot of them are starving to death or just barely getting by. Malcolm told me a story that really touched me of a, a very young child, was it three months old? That he, he was there and they had to bury the child because she died, or he died. I'm not sure if it was a boy or girl, but it doesn't matter. The child died because the mother couldn't produce enough to nourish the baby, to feed the baby, because she didn't have enough nourishment of her own. So that really brings it home. Uh, really, really touches your heart to realize how important meeting the physical need is in addition to meeting their spiritual need and guiding them to the Lord. But they've been able to get a school started. It has to be the government-approved curriculum, so it costs a little bit of money. That some of, the, some of the funds that are raised by the seed ministry go toward that. And this year, um, even furthering the, the schooling and the curriculum. And also just pro providing the basic tools they need. Um, typically, these are, are checked out. They're for community use. But if you go somewhere without electricity, without generators, um, and all you have is just manpower, these, these tools make a huge difference. So I'm going on a mission of obedience. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to tell about Jesus and his plan for salvation. Yes. Disciple people of all nations baptize them, teach them all things our Lord has commanded, and leave them with the tools, supplies, and knowledge to provide physically and spiritually for their families. That's the Great Commission carried out right there. Um, I didn't come up with that, with that on my own. God commanded us to do it, and we're going to be obedient. Won't you come too? I know many of you are not going to come with us physically, especially since we're leaving in less than a month, just a few weeks away. It'd be kind of hard to scramble that now, but you can come with us. If you can, come financially. If you can't, come through prayer. If you can't do anything else, please pray for us. Because I know one thing for sure, stealing a line from Pastor Dave that is so true. The safest place in the world is in God's will. I don't care if it's in Uganda or if it's in Fluvanna County. And I want you to just imagine, if you will, arriving to heaven. I mean, it's hard for us to, we can't imagine that in our human mind, but imagine you've arrived to heaven. Then imagine a, a Ugandan man, woman, or child is there rejoicing, praising the Lord with you. All because they had a chance to hear about Jesus and accept him as their Savior. Because you gave a dollar. You gave five dollars. Maybe, maybe you gave a thousand dollars. To the seed ministry. You have a part in it. This is not some big thing that Malcolm and I are doing. We're asking you to partner with us and go with us. Prayerfully, 
financially if you can. There will be a basket in the back today. I have a small need that's left for in-country expenses, transportation, lodging, etc. Any unforeseen circumstances? If you can give today, I'll be at the back after the service. Uh, just If you write checks, write it out to my name, D-W-A-Y-N-E. It's like Wayne with a D on the front. Phillips with two L's. Anything exceeding mine is going back to the seed ministry, back to Malcolm. This is where Uganda is located. I find it very exciting that two country fellas, plain simple folks from the dead center of Virginia, which is what Fluvanna County is, if you didn't know, are going to the center of Africa to tell about Jesus. Imagine the ripple effects that could happen from the dead center of Africa spreading out. And you can have part of it. We're going January 8th through the 22nd. Malcolm and I, Namutumba, Aronda Village, to um, not only minister to the people, but also be there with the local pastor, Alex Miracle. Now I come to the why part. I want you to understand why I'm going. I've already touched on it. I'm not going to talk about money anymore. I don't care if none of you give a dime. It's fine. You can pray for us, but I want you to hear this message. I want you to to hear the why. Um, I think some of you may identify with it. I I have a strong feeling that it's not just me that's going through the furnace. I, I have a strong feeling that it's not just me that's not being obedient to the Lord, not just mission trips. Maybe he's prompting you to do something different, and you're resisting. God blesses the obedient. Let's talk about Noah. Everybody knows who Noah was. In Genesis chapter 6, 13 and 14, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. God said, Noah, do this. If you fast forward to verse 22, thus Noah did, according to all God commanded for him. And so he did. So imagine the day Noah was in. They didn't even have the rudimentary tools that we consider today the hand tools. Imagine how long it took to build a boat big enough to hold two of every animal in your family and the food. You know people were, you know people were ridiculing him. They were making fun of him, not just two days, but year after year after year, laughing at him, poking fun at him. You're crazy. Well, I guess the laugh's on on them now, but um, (laughs) God said Noah did. Look at Abram. Abram is the name before Abraham. God said to him in Genesis 12, 1, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. Verse 4 says, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed departed from Haran. 75 years old. He already had a life made for himself. He was probably comfortable, had flocks, had family. God said, and Abram did. You know, the rest of his family and his neighbors were saying, you're crazy. You've got it made here. You've got all this. Why are you leaving? Moses did the same thing. In Exodus 3, verse 4, It says, so when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look. He's talking about the burning bush. He turned aside to look at it. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am, Lord. Moses made a lot of excuses after this point because God said, I want you to go back and bring my people out of bondage in Egypt. And it wasn't just a couple of excuses. He went on for over a chapter, all the way over to chapter 4. Um, I believe it's verse 22. And I'm going to read this because I don't want to get it wrong because it's important. I'm sorry, I said um, 4. 22. It's actually 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there. When the living God that created everything's anger is kindled against you, it's not a good place to be. But even with that, God blessed him because he eventually said, okay, God said, and he did. And look how it turned out for him. 
I can identify with that. I'm sure I've made the Lord so angry for my excuses. But let's look at Saul over in the New Testament. Saul was the John Wayne of the Pharisees. I mean, he was a man's man. He had it made. He was a Roman citizen. They, he, in those days, they had to purchase their citizenship from the Romans. And it was not cheap. It was rather expensive. And not only did he get his Roman citizenship, which gave him a huge status, he also went out and, and wreaked havoc. In, in Acts 8, um, 3, if you look at the screen or in your Bible, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. It's pretty harsh attacks. Um, goes beyond just the ridicule that we face in today's culture where they make fun of us for believing in God. But if you fast forward over to chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, Paul, or Saul at this time, was on a mission to Damascus, the Damascus Road, and he encountered someone. It says, as he journeyed and came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do there. Now, granted, this was a pretty powerful experience. Light shone from heaven. He fell to the ground and heard the Lord speaking to him. But Jesus said, Go, and Saul did. This is not just your ordinary guy. This is somebody filled with a lot of pride. Um somebody that's really looked up to, that has a lot to give up. But when he was in the presence of his Lord and heard his command, he had no choice but to be obedient and go. From this point on, he was known as Paul. And you have to stop and just visualize the situation. So he's on the road, on the way to Damascus, with his fellow companions who were probably just patting him on the back saying, you you're the best. I want to be like you when I grow up. You're just the, you're the best man in all of Israel. They didn't see the light, but it does say that they stood speechless hearing a voice, seeing no one. I have to imagine that maybe Saul was on the ground and maybe they thought this guy's acting crazy. He's making voices. And what's he doing in the dirt? And then he gets up blind and goes into the city. And from that point forward, preaches Jesus and him crucified as salvation to everyone. So I would imagine they thought he was pretty crazy. From that point out, not just his companions, but all of the leadership, all of the people that didn't believe in Jesus at that point, that weren't Christians, were seeking to kill him. So you have to ask yourself, why would Noah, Abram, Moses, Paul, and countless other prophets throughout the, the Bible, throughout God's word, why would they do this? Why would they completely changed their life for a life of persecution and attack. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Later, First, I really need to just bring it back home to us. And this is, kind of, this is personal to me because I, I am not just preaching at you. I identify with every bit of this. I just want to share it with you. Often after we've wreaked havoc in our life and the life of those around us, kicking against the goads, God gets his way. What does it mean to kick against the goads? Goading, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's going to tell you a shepherd or a livestock keeper, they take a stick or that, that hooked staff that shepherds are so known for, and they prod the, try to guide the animals. Now, if that animal doesn't go where it's supposed to go, uh, they may take the hook and pull it. But if that animal keeps fighting against the goads, they, they may take that stick and whack them upside the head or on the backside or somewhere to get them to go where they're supposed to go. That's why Jesus said, Paul or Saul, why? Why are you kicking against the goads? I have something better for you. I have a good place for you. He says that to me. He says it to you too. You just may not hear him saying it through your life. Why are you kicking against my goads? I have such a great thing in store for you. If you'll just go where I'm telling you to go. Even after... Well, let me back up. I don't want to miss that point. Free will can bless or destroy. We have free will. Every one of us are born with free will. Otherwise, I mean, it, it wouldn't be faith. Why would we need faith if we 
didn't have free will to deny our God or to deny the path he wants us to go on. But even after salvation, even after you've received Jesus as your Savior and the Lord of your life, we still have a constant battle. Flesh or the impurities in us are fighting constantly against the God's Holy Spirit within us or the perfect presence of God within us. So, I mean, it gets so discouraging sometimes when you focus on it because you want to do what God wants you to do, but then your flesh will create doubt. You'll, it'll cause you to say no to God. I'm not going to be obedient in this. This sounds crazy. But we do have hope in Jesus. Amen. We have hope in Jesus and through, yes. through God's love if we're obedient. So Jesus saved us, as I said before, through sacrificing the perfect for the imperfect. If, if anybody identifies with imperfect in here, not perfect, raise your hand. Come on now, <laughs> raise your hand, because it's every last one of us. I should raise two hands. Um, so not only did Jesus save us by being the perfect sacrifice, he also had a sacrifice full of persecution, th- full of ver- verbal and physical persecution and punishment. Public parading to further degrade him. So... If we have the only perfect person that's ever walked the earth, God in human form here, why would he allow this? Why would he allow himself to go through this punishment, this degradation? Um, All he had to do was think it. He didn't even have to call for the angels. All he had to do was just purpose it to be, and those angels would have been there, wiped everyone out, and saved him. So I did bring some props today, because I like props. Whoops, I almost lost my microphone. Can you still hear me? So, just to kind of give you a visual aid of what it was like back in those days, maybe, maybe it was a nail like this, or even bigger, that, that held him on there. You think? Maybe it was the nails that, that caused him not to be able to get off of the cross. He was nailed to that cross for you and for me by Roman soldiers. Now, they were pretty tough. They were trained from very young age to be tough. And they nailed him to the cross, swinging that hammer. Every evil swing that they made, just driving that nail further into his flesh. An already battered man being nailed to the wood. I don't care if you are a trained soldier. If you look on a battered man and that man looks you in the eyes, it's got to be a twinge somewhere to drive that nail through his flesh. There's commitment. I would imagine the first swing was probably the toughest if there was a twinge there, and then every, every swing probably got easier after that. You know what? Um, don't be fooled. Jesus could have stopped any time he wanted. He, he, it wasn't just the nails. They had no power over him. He created the elements that made the nail. I mean, the, he, they had no control over him. It was his love for you and me, all the people that ever have been and ever will be, that held him on that cross. And he stayed even though you swung the hammer time after time. You did. I did. We did. You need to think about it for a minute. I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes if you're willing. This is going to be difficult. It's difficult for me, but I, I just want you to pause for a minute. Imagine that you're the Roman soldier, if you will holding that hammer in your hand, holding the spike over Jesus' hand, just there looking at him as he's looking back at you. If you can't imagine yourself, then imagine me. I'm the Roman soldier because I can imagine myself there because I know that even though I may not have been there physically, I was there See, God knows no, he's not bound. He knows no limitations. He's not bound by time. And I was there, and I held a hammer in my hand as he looked at me, and I said, Lord, not so, Jesus. I want to be the Lord of my own life. And I drove the nail through his flesh the first time. I want what I want, and I want it now, Jesus. I drove the nail further. I want to make my own decisions. I don't want to tell others about Jesus. I'll look crazy. 
I just need some relief and pleasure in this world, Lord. I just need one more hit. Just one more easy time. Look at me, Lord. I've done great things. I don't need to read your word. I don't need to bow down to you. I'm successful. And the world tells me there's no God. And the nails are in. Listen to me. I'm an imperfect man. I've done a lot of terrible things in my life, but my Lord loved me so much he came and died even though he knew that my actions would nail him to that cross. He stayed on that cross because he loved me and he did the same thing for you. Even though we were there, he saw us from that cross. And he stayed because he loved you. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please come now. You may not have another day. Come and accept him as your Savior and be obedient. Don't be afraid about anybody looking at you or what people at your work or your personal life are going to think about you being crazy because he died for you and he's the only way you're going to get into heaven. If you do know Christ, if God is calling you to do something, whether it be sponsor a mission trip, go on a mission trip, start a new ministry, whatever the case might be, be obedient because God blesses obedience. That's all I have to say. If the worship team's able, come. And let's have a song. If not, we've got music queued up to play. Please come now. Please come now and accept Jesus as your Savior. Come and ask him for forgiveness over the disobedience in your life. I encourage you just to listen to these words now. Because I think God, this is my favorite song. I think God prepared this song and the words in this song just for us today. Hello, my name is Dave and I'm the pastor here at Antioch Baptist Church. I just want to thank you for joining us for this time of praise and worship. I hope that it impacted your life and that it inspired you to take your relationship with God to the next level. If you were watching today and you felt convicted by the Lord to accept Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Just say, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you to make me new. I invite you into my life to be my Lord and to be my master. I believe that you rose from the dead and I believe that you are the Son of God and I believe that you will return to the earth again to take me home to be with you. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and if you responded to this message today, we'd love to hear about it. I want you to contact us here at the church and let us know about the impact that it's had on your life so that we can celebrate with you and so that we can give you some resources to help you in furthering your walk with Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you. And remember to love, connect, go, and grow. the power of sin and all.